intestinal diseases. Uh, Bridget is uh, currently an assistant professor of uh, dermatology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, she was uh, born in Iowa City. Uh, her uh, parents uh, both are, uh, are employed by the University of Iowa, and her dad's a uh, PM&R uh, physician there on the faculty. Um, she uh, left Iowa City uh, briefly to go uh, in a neighboring uh, city to go to college, where she uh, played uh, Division uh, I um, uh, softball. Uh, at uh, Drake University, and then um, then she went back to University of Iowa. I think let's see, she went back there for medical school, um, and then uh, left there and went to the neighboring state of uh, of Wisconsin, where she did her dermatology training. Uh, then after that, spent a year with uh, with people at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, doing a, a fellowship in uh, complex uh, medical dermatology. Uh, she then rejoined the faculty where she trained at the University of Wisconsin, which is where she is now, and she uh, runs their inpatient service and deals with patients with complex uh, cutaneous uh, disease that interfaces with uh, internal uh, disease. And so, uh, Bridget, welcome to uh, vir welcome virtually to Louisville, uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing your uh, your talk. No, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for having me, and thank you for the warm introduction. I am bummed I can't be there in person, but but I'm really glad I'm able to do this virtually today. Um, as was mentioned, I do run a specific GI derm clinic within our, the Department of Dermatology, and I often get asked, like, well, that's a very narrow focus. What kind of things do you see? And, and I used to think that as well, and then I started a GI derm clinic specifically at Penn and then really brought it over to the University of Wisconsin, and recognize very quickly that this is an enormous topic. I see everything from underlying intestinal disease to hepatobiliary conditions with skin manifestations to nutritional dermatoses and really see an incredible spectrum of complex systemic disease. So, you know, in thinking about what I wanted to cover, I, I thought it was such an enormous topic that instead of just breezing through a lot of, of, of surface level information, I would really do a deep dive into three specific conditions that are, are medically related, not just to dermatology and gastroenterology, but also immunology, allergy, and rheumatology. So here are my relevant disclosures. I may briefly discuss the off-label use of medications today. The learning objectives were posted, I know, but really this is for, designed for dermatologists and non-dermatologists to recognize the manifestations of, of cutaneous disease that, that are related to underlying systemic gastrointestinal disease, allergic and immunologic disorders, and recognize those skin findings really early in their development to prevent subsequent morbidity and mortality. Really, I'll talk briefly about initial and long-term approaches to management of the three conditions we discussed today. And really, I wanna highlight the overarching theme of multidisciplinary care in, in really giving patients with systemic disease a good treatment. So here are the topics we're gonna to discuss today. And the way that I picked these topics was I looked at what came into my clinic over the course of a week. And I picked something that was geographically relevant to you guys down in Louisville. I picked something that was relatively prevalent amongst the United States population. And then I picked one condition that is really a, a do not miss condition and it can pre pretty significantly prevent patient morbidity if you pick it up early. So I know you guys typically in the Department of Medicine start with a case presentation, but I'm gonna start by telling you guys a story and then we will get into a case. So I'm gonna tell you guys the story behind why Martha Stewart went to prison. I'm sure many of you are rolling your eyes because you're like, we all know it was for insider trading, but many of you may not recognize how medically relevant her case was. It all centered around a stock that she held in a company called I'm Clone Systems Incorporated, which was a small biopharmaceutical company in the New York area. It, it was really developed to developing biologic medications for the area of oncology. And one particular biologic that they developed was the medication cetuximab. Now cetuximab, as many of you probably know, is a human urine chimerized IgG1 monoclonal antibody directed at the epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR. Now, EGFR signaling pathways are aberrantly active in a number of different malignancies, including colorectal carcinoma and head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And in keeping, if you're able to block that pathway with a monoclonal antibody, then in turn, you can prevent cancer cell proliferation, invasion, metastasis, and neoangiogenesis, which are all principles that we know are central to malignancy. So what happened with the case of this stock and really what happened with the cetuximab medication? 
While cetuximab was undergoing its initial clinical trials for its use in malignancy in 2000 and 2001. As the trials progressed, the company actually started to publish many of their positive outcomes, resulting in the stock price climbing relatively quickly and savvy investors like Martha Stewart investing heavily in the company. Unfortunately, there were many issues with the initial design of the cetuximab trials, including poorly defined inclusion criteria, inconsistent treatment regimens across different patients, and, and a series of these unreported infusion hypersensitivity reactions that were not being disclosed to the FDA. Now, in 2001, the IM Clone Systems company set forth a plan to report these adverse infusion reactions, and Martha's stockbroker was alerted to this plan to report relatively early, and basically alerted her to sell her stock before the, the stock plummeted. Of course, immediately after this disclosure, an investigation was opened and the stock did, it did in fact plummet. Now, since that time, this company has been bought by Bristol-Myers Squibb, and new trials were initiated centered around cetuximab for its use in different types of malignancy. And in fact, in 2004, cetuximab received FDA approval for its use in advanced colorectal carcinoma. But what I want to highlight is it was really through these better trials and this ongoing investigation that we began to really understand cetuximab infusion reactions. So pretty consistently across subjects, patients reported a relatively rapid onset within one hour of the cetuximab infusion, and symptoms included pruritus of the palms and soles, urticaria, diarrhea, hypotension, angioedema, and full-blown anaphylaxis. Now, it didn't take long for people to realize that this was likely an IgE-mediated hypersensitivity reaction, and IgE antibodies were, de were noted against the FAB heavy portion of the cetuximab molecule. However, the exact cause of the reaction really remained a, a mystery for a while until allergists began to notice a striking geographic distribution of cases, preferentially involving southeastern states. In fact, if you looked at rates of cetuximab infusion reactions from these initial trials, reactions in the south, specifically these five states, were right around 22% of patients receiving the infusion, while contrasting that against area, patients receiving the infusion in the north, reactions were less than 1% of individuals. So, an allergist at the University of Virginia, Dr. Platts Mills, went on to identify IgE antibodies directed against cetuximab not only in patients with these hypersensitivity reactions receiving the medication for colorectal cancer, but also in a series of control subjects without malignancy who had actually never received cetuximab. He identified that control subjects with IgE antibodies against cetuximab were preferentially higher in the South, and he compared these rates. So if you look at page control subjects from Tennessee, about 20% of patients had IgE antibody against cetuximab but had never received the medication. He contrasted this against case, patients in Cal, Northern California, where about 6% of patients had IgE antibodies to cetuximab, and Boston, where less than 1% of patients had IgE antibody to cetuximab. Dr. Platts Mills went on to conduct a series of experiments that essentially epitope mapped the cetuximab antibody and found that in these patients that were having these hypersensitivity reactions, they all had IgE antibodies that were specific for an oligosaccharide, the lactose alpha-1,3 galactose, which was, of course, present on the FAB portion of the heavy chain of the cetuxamab molecule. And basically, to, he, he was able to find that galactose alpha-1,3 galactose was identified as causative of these cetuxamab allergic reactions. So what is galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, also, also turned as alpha-gal, which I'll refer to it as for the remainder of this talk. So alpha-gal is a carbohydrate moiety that is expressed on different glycoproteins and glycolipids. And it's actually relatively well conserved across bacteria, animals, and, and non-primate mammals. Of course, humans do not express alpha-gal on membrane surfaces, and this is thought to have developed as an evolutionarily advantageous mechanism to prevent infection. It is actually well known that enveloped viruses use this specific sugar moiety as a portal of entry for cellular entry and invasion and infection. So it's evolution, evolutionarily advantageous that humans do not have this sugar on cell surfaces. However, because immunocompetent humans do express natural antibody to alpha-gal through exposure to bowel flora. So like I just told you, bacteria express alpha-gal, and we all have bacteria in the bowel. And because of that, many immunocompetent humans have natural antibody, IgM, IgG2, and IgA against alpha-gal. And, and interestingly, it's actually this specific oligosaccharide that's one of the major barriers to the transplantation of organs 
from other mammals into humans. So <clears throat> that brings us to our case. What we've covered so far is that cetuximab is a biologic medication that creates a type 1 hypersensitivity infusion reaction relatively rapidly after infusion. Those reactions are due to an alpha-gal sugar moiety that is on the surface of the heavy chain portion of the cetuximab molecule. How does that relate to GI derm? Let's walk through this case together. A man in his 50s presented to the University of Virginia's emergency department with diffuse pruritus and generalized urticaria. He notes he had gone to dinner, he'd had a ribeye steak with friends, he went home, he went to bed, and within a couple of hours he was awoken from sleep with diarrhea, cramping abdominal pain, and pruritic palms and soles. He had been previously healthy with no prior medications and no known allergies. On presentation, he was hypotensive and he had multiple diffuse, well-circumscribed wheels consistent with an urticarial process on the skin. He had edema of the lips and tongue, and his workup included an elevated total IgE level of 550 and an elevated tryptase level of 18. He was treated with epinephrine, antihistamines, and methylprednisolone with improvement of his symptoms, and he was termed at the time idiopathic anaphylaxis because there was no clear trigger of specifically food or medication prior to the onset of his reaction. Now, interestingly, this patient was not alone. He was actually amongst a series of patients presenting to allergy clinic at the University of Virginia, reporting this delayed onset anaphylaxis after eating meat. They noted, many of the patients noted that it was like sort of an atypical reaction. It didn't happen every time they ate meat. It wasn't with every kind of meat, and it was often delayed a few hours after consuming meat. <clears throat> Now, there's an allergy immunology fellow at the time who was working in the Platts Mills lab, this same lab who had developed, that had developed this alpha-gal IgE assay. And he had worked on this cetuximab project, and he'd worked on this alpha-gal reaction with IgE assay. And he basically said, well, let's screen some of these patients to see if they have a similar sugar moiety. And so in doing so, they screened just four patients for alpha-gal antibodies. Sure enough, four of four patients exhibited, exhibited positive Ig antibodies to alpha-gal, and all of these patients reported these delayed meat allergy symptoms. This same group went on to enroll 24 patients, both from Virginia and Missouri, with a similar history of anaphylaxis or urticaria that occurred within three to six hours after ingesting red meat. And sure enough, 24 of 24 had Ig antibodies directed against alpha-gal. They went on to do CAPRAS testing, which revealed a specific IgA antibody to red meat, as well as intradermal testing with red meat reagents, as evidenced here, which elicited a reaction in 100% of patients. And you'll notice it's purely to red meat. There were no reactions to chicken, turkey, or fish. Now, further supporting this data, these patients eliminated red meat completely from their diet and had almost complete symptom resolution, supporting this theory that red meat allergy was also caused by the alpha-gal sugar in specific animals. But the question remained, why were these cases, much like the cetuximab allergy, preferentially occurring in the South? As this data was being collected and analyzed, one of the lab techs in the Platts Mill lab actually developed a similar reaction. He said he had eaten meat for 40 years without any trouble, and suddenly he went to dinner one night, went home, went to sleep, and was awoken from sleep with full-on anaphylaxis after steak injection. Of course, everyone in the lab was curious. What had he done before? What possible exposures could have triggered this eruption? And he said, gosh, the only thing that was really different in my history was that we went hiking about a month ago, and I suffered numerous tick bites. Using this new information from the lab tech, as well as some early work that was being done in Australia looking specifically at tick bite and red meat allergy, the Platts Mills lab actually started to overlay cases of these alpha-gal reactions either to cetuximab or red meat with different geographic or environmental triggers, and specifically ticks. And actually, what they initially thought was that Rocky Mountain spotted fever cases may be the initial sensitization to this IgE development against alpha-gal, because as you can see, the Rocky Mountain spotted fever cases overlay very, very nicely with the map they had developed. But it was subsequently recognized that cases seemed to better fit the distribution of a different predominantly southern tick. And of course, that is Amblyoma americanum, or the Lone Star Tick. Of course, it's such named because of the single white spot on the back of it. Now, in early mouse models, and to further support this theory, they actually injected tick salivary antigen, or tick salivary extract from the Lone Star Tick into a series of different mice, and were able to produce the same allergic response to alpha-gal that was seen in humans. 
Of course, current studies are now ongoing to determine exactly what intake saliva and how this process happens. And some of that early data it was presented at conferences this year, but is not yet in the literature. Now, interestingly, I'll point out that Amblyomma americanum, specifically thought to be a southern tick, is now creeping northward. And in keeping, a large number of meat allergy cases have been reported in the New York, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut area in the past few years. And in fact, we've had two at the University of Wisconsin. So putting this together, there's something about the Lone Star tick that it feeds on an alpha-gal-containing animal, subsequently bites a human, and there's something about the tick salivary antigen that induces an IgE response against alpha-gal sugar moiety specifically. Within one to three months, humans consume meat, and within a couple of hours, they go on to develop this delayed urticaria angioedematous or anaphylactic reaction. So I was introduced as a dermatologist. I am a dermatologist. Why am I telling you guys about this allergy case? Well, as a medical dermatologist, I can tell you I see a case of urticaria almost every day. And I quickly wondered how many cases of alpha-gal syndrome was I missing in my clinic? Thankfully, the same allergy group at the University of Virginia also had this question. And so they screened patients in their allergy clinic and identified 29 who carried the diagnosis of either chronic urticaria or chronic idiopathic urticaria for a couple of years. They went on to um, take a history on possible meat allergy and 20 patients reported a history of delayed reactions to mammalian meat. And 29 of those patients subsequently went on to have positive IgE antibodies against alpha-gal specifically. Further of this cohort, 95% of patients reported a prior tick bite and 45% reported a bite specifically to amblyomma americanum. This is the data that they had. Now, of the 20 patients with positive dietary history and positive IgE against alpha-gal, 15, 15 of them had data um, on dietary history and, and improvement, with, um, in, improvement with avoidance of meat, basically. And nine of 15 patients had complete resolution of symptoms with red meat avoidance, and all but one had partial improvement of symptoms with red meat avoidance. And so to me, this is one of the reasons I present this, because it suggests that red meat allergy may be more common than is recognized, specifically in the right geographic locations, as a trigger of chronic idiopathic urticaria. It's certainly an entity that I think dermatologists should know about, and, and primary care physicians as well should really be screening for this in, in their line of questioning. Now, that's one reason I present this. The other reason I present this case is because it really represents a major paradigm shift in how we think about food allergy and food-induced urticaria. And so most food allergies are specifically due to protein. So if you think about a peanut allergy, it's due to a protein molecule that results in a relatively rapid onset of allergic response, right? Anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours, but usually not longer. Red meat allergy is different. It's against a sugar moiety, and specifically, it's a sugar that's coupled with a lipid-laden food source. That's meat. Now, we know that fat from food has to be absorbed. It has to be absorbed in the intestinal lumen. Subsequently, broken into, glycolipids have to be broken into chylomicrons. It has to enter the lymphatic circulation via the thoracic duct. And really, not until all of that has been completed does it enter systemic circulation. And this whole process takes anywhere from three to four hours, which actually relatively nicely fits that timeline of time to reaction in red meat allergy. Now, if you recall, the patients who reacted against cetuximab, the alpha-gal molecule in cetuximab, had an almost immediate reaction, and that's probably because that was given intravenously. You know, equally interesting to me is this thought that these allergy symptoms exist on a spectrum, and they can't really define which patients will have only urticaria and which patients will go on to full-blown anaphylaxis. But again, it makes me wonder if we are somehow missing other sugar moieties or other sugar and, and fat complex molecules that may trigger urticaria in a subset of patients. Finally, I present this at a medicine conference because even if you're not regularly seeing or treating patients with urticaria and allergy, there are a number of pharmaceutical agents or bio-derived devices that are made from animals that contain alpha-gal sugar. For example, some forms of heparin are porcine or bovine derivatives, and similarly, many cardiac valves are animal derivatives. So while rarely reported, there are cases of both urticaria and anaphylaxis reported to each of these bio biomedical products that improved with removal of the product. So what I do when I see these patients, and really I've only seen two at Wisconsin, I, I immediately call my friends probably too excitedly in allergy and immunology, and I definitely send them over to them for, for um, ongoing care. 
I recommend initial avoidance of red meat, and I know that they do as well, and some forms of dairy, and specifically it's the forms of dairy with high levels of milk fat, so things like ice cream. What's also interesting about this allergy is that it may not be a lifelong process. So in talking with my friends who are allergists over at the University of Wisconsin, they say, you know, we really trend the alpha-gal levels of IgE, and as those levels trend down, we do try to reintroduce meat slowly. And of course, there are things that can help medically um, to in, if there's any accidental exposure as patients are trying to avoid red meat. So the key points from this case are that delayed allergy to red meat is common in the southeast. It's an IgE-mediated process with a spectrum of severity, some patients with urticaria and others with full-blown anaphylaxis. And the patients with chronic idiopathic urticaria really should at least be screened for dietary history that are consistent with this type of reaction prior to ongoing, uh, to on ongoing assessment of IgE antibodies against alpha-gal specifically. And some of our patients, this may have implications for other types of food allergy, and it may be medically relevant for other allergic reactions. I'll pause there for questions before we move to our next case. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll jump in and ask you a question, Bridget. Please. So, uh, so the people who are going to take rituximab who develop this reaction, can they be treated in some way to prevent them to be able to take the medicine without having uh, the urticarial reactions or anaphylaxis? Um, yes, yes, in some capacity. So similar to pre-medication with other infusion reactions, there are some cases that are prevented with that pre-medication, um, but that's not true of all cases. And again, part of the challenge with this is really understanding which patients are primarily urticaria and are going to have skin reaction only, and which ones are going to go on to full-blown anaphylaxis. And then the, my second sort of question or comment, yeah. I had a patient who who uh, believes that she has alpha-gal syndrome. I'm not sure if she does or not, sure. but uh, she was uh, she has psoriasis and was on uh, biologic therapy with uh, etanercept uh -huh. and um, told me that, uh, that uh, because it was derived from, um, yeah. you know, as a biologic agent, that she yeah. was afraid of taking it. Now, I don't think that she had any problem even when she did take it, but, uh, but she was so excited about uh, avoiding it um, <laughs> that she didn't want to take is that Is there any rationale to that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say no, and I'd say there, the reality is most of these reactions that we're seeing to these other um, porcine or bovine-derived products are much more minimal than the reaction we're seeing with the patients who go on to full-blown anaphylaxis. And so I think the risk is actually very small, and most reactions when they develop are more urticarial process, itching, diarrhea. Um, most of them are, are not life-threatening reactions. So, um, I, you know, I would say probably not. I guess I would still start it in, in maybe combination with the allergy immunology department and make sure she has an EpiPen if needed, but I, I don't think there's a good underlying reason for her to not have a tanner set. Okay, I don't see any uh, questions in the uh, in the chat. Uh, does, if anybody has any questions, ask them now or wait till we get to the end of the talk. And otherwise, I think we'll uh, move on. Very good. So we will move on to something that is routinely classified as food allergy, but it, but it's sort of a misnomer when it's called a true food allergy. And, and we'll talk about dermatitis herpetiformis. So this is the case of a man in his 30s who presented to dermatology clinic with a six month history of recurrent crops of pritic papules and vesicles overlying the extensor elbows, knees, scalp, and buttocks. He did have an underlying atopic history, but at the time of the visit, he said, I really had no abdominal pain, cramping, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, melena, or hematochesia. He did endorse an unintentional 15-pound weight loss over the preceding three months. His examination was notable for multiple group papules and vesicles overlying the extensor elbows and forearms. And, and what you see with a lot of these patients, and you can sort of see it here, is that a lot of the vesicles are not really intact. They've actually been excoriated and are really just left with serum crusting and hemorrhage. And that's because dermatitis herpetiformis is so itchy that patients often will scratch off those vesicles quickly. On examination, you incidentally notice these asymptomatic scattered petechial lesions on the lateral fingers and the palmar surfaces. Upon questioning, the patient says, oh yeah, these have slowly developed over the past two years. I, I think they're just blood blisters, but I really don't have any good reason to have developed them. There's really been no trauma, but they really don't bother me, so I've sort of just left them alone. Of course, as a dermatologist, the first thing you're going to do is a biopsy when you see something that, that you want to diagnose. And, and so the way that we do a biopsy is a little bit nuanced for these cases, and I just want to highlight how and where we biopsy. 
Of course, we're going to do a biopsy of the lesional skin or the acute inflammatory process or a vesicle. And this is going to go for hematoxylin and eosin staining specifically. That's your lesional biopsy. The biopsy that's actually very, very important in many immunobullous diseases is this perilesional biopsy of relatively normal appearing skin. It should be about a centimeter away from your lesional surface. And it's really important that it is a perilesional biopsy, not another lesional biopsy. And this one is going for direct immu immunofluorescence, which I'll show you guys next. So the patient's results come back and you see a dense neutrophilic aggregate in the dermal papillae with superficial dermal edema and dermal hemorrhage. So here's what you're looking at. This is a hematoxylin and eosin stain section. This is the epidermis extending down here. Coming up to meet it is the papillary dermis. And you can see it's just chock full of neutrophils here. And in fact, it makes sense that this is a blistering condition because you can see this beginning of a cleft or a blister a split between the epidermis and the dermis. And there's lots of, of edema in this area, which is why all of this inflammation basically distorts the tissue enough for that split to happen. Now, the perilesional biopsy that I highlighted as particularly important goes for direct immunofluorescence staining. And what we're looking for there is particular antibodies, and in this case, a particular pattern of antibodies in the dermal papillae. So it's a staining pattern that demonstrates granular IgA in the dermal papillae, and this is pathognomonic for dermatitis herpetiformis. So this grain-like deposition of IgA in the dermal papillae is what triggers this reaction. And we'll talk through the pathogenesis in just a minute. So dermatitis herpetiformis is a cutaneous manifestation of celiac disease. Celiac disease is highly prevalent in the United States, and actually it's thought that really only 10 to 15% of cases are, are diagnosed. Um, and that's for two reasons. It, it's thought that because there's genetic predisposition, if one person in the family is diagnosed, then many people either empirically start a gluten-free diet or assume they also have celiac disease. Uh, the other reason is that it, it's often being diagnosed, um, one person is being diagnosed in the family much, much more quickly, and then everyone else sort of just takes on that diet by, by default. Now, dermatitis herpetiformis may actually serve as an early cutaneous marker of this underlying gastrointestinal, of, of a patient's underlying gastrointestinal health, and specifically their underlying celiac disease. What I really want to highlight here is if you see patients with dermatitis herpetiformis, over 90% of them have underlying intestinal enteropathy. So if you look at the intestine, it is abnormal and they have intestinal disease. Why this is important is that only 20% of patients that come into your clinic report gastrointestinal symptoms. So patients with dermatitis herpetiformis almost always have quiescent intestinal symptoms. And anecdotally, I can say that is true as well. So how does something that is primarily a, a process or inflammation in the intestine extend to the skin? And I know this is somewhat basic science heavy, so I'll just hit high points here. Wheat or gluten is broken down into gliadin, and gliadin is actually the antigenic molecule in celiac disease. This, of course, happens in the intestinal lumen and then is subsequently transported into the lamina propria, where that gliadin is deamidated by an enzyme called tissue transglutaminase, TG2. And again, it's TG2 and gliadin that are pathogenic in celiac disease. So this tissue transglutaminase and gliadin form a complex that is essentially recognized by the immune system as abnormal or foreign. And it activates a pretty significant inflammatory cascade that results in pretty significant intestinal mucosal damage. And with time, this creates villus atrophy and crypt hyperplasia as we see in celiac disease. Now, interestingly, transglutaminase enzymes are not limited to the intestinal surface, but are actually present in a series of different organs, including the skin. And in the skin, transglutaminases are named epidermal transglutaminases, and they're involved in cross-linking molecules for skin barrier function. Now, as patients with celiac disease are continually exposed to gliadin, B cells trigger IgE antibodies against tissue transglutaminase. So that's this orange antibody here. An IgA antibody develops against tissue transglutaminase. But then it's thought that something called epitope spreading occurs. And this means that the original tissue damage from a primary inflammatory process, or the celiac disease that we just talked about, then goes on to release and expose a previously sequestered antigen, leading to a secondary autoimmune response against this new antigen. In this case, this new antigen is the epidermal transglutaminase enzyme that is in the skin. Epidermal transglutaminase is also called TG3. So when IgA antibodies against epidermal transglutaminase circulate and reach the epidermis, they actually form a complex locally within the dermal papillae or beneath the, the epidermal surface. And this is exactly what we were measuring with that direct immunofluorescence. We were looking for these IgA antibodies in the dermal papillae. 
Of course, these immune complexes create neutrophilic re recruitment. They have neutrophils come to the area and form that significant neutrophilic inflammation with abscesses and, and the full subepidermal blister that we see clinically. And so understanding this process is really helpful when you look at a patient clinically because, you know, you come in, you say, oh, this is classic vesicles on the extensor surfaces, this is DH. Well, it is DH, but what makes sense now is that you have IgA antibodies combined with epidermal transglutaminase enzyme, and that complex in turn brings neutrophils and edema to this area and that subepidermal blister that we looked at on pathology. Again, DH is relatively a symmetric process that favors the elbows, knees, extensor forearms, back, and buttocks. And this is a classic picture of dermatitis herpetiformis on the buttocks, where again, the vesicles that you would typically see are all eroded because it's so pruritic that patients have scratched them open. I'll just highlight some of the more rare cutaneous manifestations, including isolated scalp or facial involvement, which has been reported. And in these patients, they're often misdiagnosed with an allergic contact dermatitis initially because they come in with an itchy vesicular rash that really doesn't have the characteristic distribution. The other uh, cutaneous manifestation I'll highlight are these acral petechia, and really if you're not looking for them, you'll miss them, but if you start looking for them in your DH patients, you'll pick them up regularly. So they're typically present on lateral finger at borders and palmar surfaces, and they present with these almost arcuate macules and, and different petechia. And I will say that at least anecdotally, almost all of the patients that I have with these have no gastrointestinal symptoms whatsoever. Now, if you've ever followed around a dermatologist, you notice they carry a funny light called a dermatoscope. And, and what we do is we look at different structures in the, in the skin surface or things below the skin to look at patterns. And so if you look at these lesions with the dermatoscope, they look like this. And you can see how you could almost convince yourself this is a little bit of epidermal hemorrhage or hemorrhage beneath the dermal hemorrhage. But essentially, if you biopsy one of these spots, it looks just like the vesicular eruption that we saw with the elbows. You have sheets of neutrophils stuffed into dermal papillae in this subepidermal cleft. So how do we make the diagnosis of dermatitis herpetiformis? Really, again, it's that characteristic direct immunofluorescent staining pattern for granular IgA and dermal papillae. Now, you can support that diagnosis with serologies, including anti-tissue transglutaminase 2, IgA antibodies, this is intestinal disease specific, and anti-epidermal transglutaminase, or TG3 antibodies, that is skin specific. Of course, if you're gonna check IgA antibodies, you wanna check a total serum IgA level because selective IgA deficiency is much more common in patients with celiac disease and dermatitis herpetiformis. Now, I refer almost all of my DH patients to gastroenterology, um, and, and I let them discuss upper endoscopy with small bowel biopsy. I do that not because we have not already made the diagnosis, but mostly because if they don't have intestinal symptoms, they really don't believe that they have underlying enteropathy, and they're much less inclined to follow a gluten-free diet until we prove that. And then, of course, DH and celiac disease patients sh share the same genetic predisposition. And so if you have a patient who comes in who's empirically started a gluten-free diet, you can do genetic testing to confirm their diagnosis. So my approach to management specifically of skin disease is really twofold. I try to calm down the acute inflammation since patients are so miserable, and I do that with Dapsone. The skin is really, really Dapsone responsive. So within 48 to 72 hours of initiating the medication, you'll find that their itching really abates pretty quickly. And that's because Dapsone is anti-neutrophilic. And I'd say almost hemolysis occurs in virtually every patient who starts Dapsone, and that's because sulfones specifically produce an, anti an oxidant stress on aging red blood cells. So in patients with G6PD deficiency, that stress is much more severe and hemolysis is much more severe. And so you're always going to screen for G6PD deficiency before starting Dapsone. My initial dose is usually 25 to 50 milligrams daily, and I'll go up to anywhere from 100 to 250 milligrams a day in patients to help control their disease. But what I highlight to patients is that they just want to take a pill and not follow a gluten-free diet. That is not the answer. So this is a, an, acute, uh, an acute treatment, and it's short-term. So I don't refill this for months and months and months. I give them a couple of weeks' worth with the plan that we're ultimately bridging to a gluten-free diet, and that's their maintenance therapy. Um, I, at least anecdotally, in talking to dermatologists in different places, I find that they're often refilling Dapsone for patients for many years, and, and that to me suggests that that patient is really not careful with their gluten-free dietary adherence. 
And why that matters is because patients with dermatitis herpetiformis and celiac disease carry an increased risk of enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma, as well as other autoimmune conditions. And the thought is that this is due to long-term gluten exposure and, and ongoing intestinal inflammation. And actually, if they follow a gluten-free diet, the earlier they do it, the more protective it is, specifically against the development of lymphoma. In fact, some of the work that we recently did using the Celiac Disease Foundation's patient-powered research network essentially looked at patients who presented with celiac disease, but primarily with skin symptoms versus those presenting primarily with intestinal disease symptoms, and basically looked at odds of dietary counseling on a gluten-free diet. And patients with DH really had twice the odds of not recalling any counseling on a gluten-free diet at time of no diagnosis. So the takeaway from this is really that DH patients need a lifelong gluten-free diet. Now, I will say there are a subset of patients with relatively refractory dermatitis herpetiformis, despite what they say is careful dietary adherence. Of course, the first thing I check is, are they, are they truly adherent to a gluten-free diet? Because it is a very hard diet to follow. And then, of course, I screen for any sort of accidental exposure they could be getting through eating out or um, different food sources. Now, the FDA, if you go to the supermarket and you look at the gluten-free food section, the FDA regulates gluten-free food to less than 20 parts per million, yet multiple lab studies have shown that less than 20 parts per million can still flare dermatitis herpetiformis and probably also induces some level of intestinal, intestinal damage. And then the other thing I screen for in patients with really refractory skin disease who are, are really careful with their diet are, is for iodine exposure. So iodine is thought to actually alter the epidermal transglutaminase molecule and significantly increase that process of inflammation in the skin. And, and so specifically foods like seaweed, seafood, eggs, dairy, and iodized salt can flare dermatitis herpetiformis. And I have a couple of patients with DH who say they can really only eat one or two eggs at a time any more than that really flares their disease. And that's probably due to the iodine content. And then similarly, iodine is included in multiple different medical therapies, so I just want you to be aware of those. Patients sometimes have flaring of DH after receiving IV contrast. Key points from this case is that celiac disease is prevalent in the United States. A subset of those patients develop dermatitis herpetiformis, and it can be an early cutaneous marker of their underlying intestinal disease. Prolonged gliadin exposure in these patients may occur because they often have quiescent intestinal symptoms, and so I'd just be aware that these patients probably do have underlying enteropathy. And if you see these patients, while Dapsone is excellent at controlling the skin disease initially, it does not treat intestinal disease, nor does it protect against long-term lymphoma development, and so these patients truly need a lifelong gluten-free diet. Before we move on to our next case, I'll pause again for any questions that people have. Okay. All right. Well, we will then move on to our do not miss case, which is case number three. And this is the case of a, a gentleman in his 20s who presented to the emergency department with a painful, rapidly expanding ulceration on the right lower leg of two weeks duration. He had been treated intermittently with antibiotics without improvement, and he did report associated lethargy, shortness of breath, anorexia, and weight loss. His medical history was significant for esophageal reflux disease, for which he was treated with pantoprazole. Now, his examination was notable for almost multiple sort of coalescing ulcerations with this beefy red friable base and this violaceous, dusky, undermined border and significant overlying exudate of the wound. He was noted to have a leukocytosis, microcytic anemia, and elevated inflammatory markers, and specifically a fecal calprotectin of 1,500. His limited rheumatologic workup was negative, and his SPEP and UPEP were both normal. Of course, dermatologists did a biopsy and noted a dense neutrophilic infiltrate with necrosis and hemorrhage consistent with pyoderma gangrenosum. When we do that biopsy, we usually do a tissue culture as well, and that was without growth, and that helps us rule out infectious causes of ulceration. Because of the elevated fecal calprotectin, he went on to have a colonoscopy, which revealed friable intestinal mucosa with ulceration of the terminal, terminal ileum consistent with Crohn's disease. So pyoderma gangrenosum is a rare neutrophilic dermatosis, and it is a sterile condition. I will highlight that it is not specific to inflammatory bowel disease, but can be reactive to numerous different underlying systemic conditions. It is seen in up to 5% of patients with underlying inflammatory bowel disease, and it's typically Caucasian women in their 50s or older. I'll highlight that, again, if you see pyoderma gangrenosum on the skin, 
almost 50% of cases or over 50% of cases are associated with underlying systemic disease. And so the answer is really to go looking for that underlying driver condition. And most commonly, these are inflammatory bowel disease, different inflammatory arthritis, and underlying hematologic disorders. This is a multi-center study of 356 patients. And what I want to highlight here is that inflammatory bowel disease was the only medical comorbidity that was more common in patients younger than 65, while malignancy and hematologic disorders were much more common in patients older than 65. So again, if you have a young patient presenting with pyoderma gangrenosum, you really should be thinking about inflammatory bowel disease as that underlying driver condition. Now, there are five recognized subtypes of pyoderma gangrenosum, and because we're talking about PG in the context of inflammatory bowel disease specifically today, we're just going to highlight the types that are highly associated with IBD. So ulcerative pyoderma gangrenosum is your classic, most common subtype that typically presents with a pustule or a painful nodule and rapidly expands into an ulcer. You'll notice these vilacious, undermined borders and an overhanging epidermal edge. And again, this is, the, this is the, the type that's associated with inflammatory bowel disease, different rheumatologic conditions, and, and myeloproliferative disorders. Pustular pyoderma gangrenosum is also strongly IBD-associated, and it actually tends to arise during acute exacerbation of inflammatory bowel disease, and then subsequently improves with treatment of the underlying intestinal condition. And finally, peristomal PG may develop re immediately after or well after, months to years after stoma creation surgery, and it's thought that it may represent a pathogenic response to the surgical trauma of stoma creation. And then in keeping, because stoma output is irritating and because patients routinely put adhesives and, and different stomal appliances on this area, that may continue to pathogenize the skin around the stoma. So, so what is pathergy? Pathergy is the phenomenon of developing a new or worsening skin lesion after trauma to the skin. And that trauma can be incidental, it can be a needle stick, it can be a surgical incision. And it happens in anywhere from 20 to 30% of patients with pyoderma gangrenosum. And we actually test for pathergy. We do this by inserting an 18 to 22 gauge sterile needle. We twist it and we check for the development of a papule or a pustule 24 to 48 hours later. And that's exactly what happened with this gentleman at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, as a dermatologist, I love pathergy because it narrows my diagnosis relatively quickly. And so pathergy is a clue. It's not something to be afraid of. I think we often get called with people who are hesitant to do biopsies on pyoderma gangrenosum because they're worried they'll make it worse. And the truth is you probably will acutely, but it helps you get your answer. So this is one of my patients who came in with the, the ulcer here, and I biopsied the edge of the ulcer right where that arrow is located. And within a couple of days, his pyoderma gangrenosum looked like this. So he pathergized. And, and I remember his primary care calling me and sending me pictures and saying like, oh my gosh, you made him so much worse. And I said, no, no, this is so great. We know the diagnosis. Um, and, and of course, his, his histology went on to support that. But you don't want to be afraid to biopsy. You actually need a biopsy to make this diagnosis. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. A couple of other clinical clues to diagnosis. One is this cribriform scarring. And what I mean by cribriform scarring is basically like the scars in a crosshatch pattern, almost like you take cheesecloth and push it against the skin. And you get you can you can notice that it really nicely here, kind of along these edges, and then up here as well, and then here as well. You, you notice this almost crosshatch pattern of scarring as it starts to heal in. This is, again, another patient who presented with ul this ulcer specifically, also reported blood in his stool but had never been worked up for inflammatory bowel disease, was subsequently diagnosed with Crohn's, was started on prednisone and adalimumab, and again, within a couple of months, looked like this. Another clue to the diagnosis of, of pyoderma gangrenosum, and I noticed this one in peristomal disease specifically, is something called epithelial stranding. So when you have multiple ulcers that are almost coalescing but leaving thin islands of intact epidermis, I think this is a really nice clue to peristomal pyoderma gangrenosum. Now, there are some proposed diagnostic criteria for pyoderma gangrenosum. I don't find these particularly helpful because one of the major criteria is that other causes have been excluded. And I'll tell you, as a dermatologist, it's really hard to go through and say, I've excluded absolutely everything that this could be. But I'll highlight one of the minor criteria, which are the histopathologic findings. And that basically means, and the takeaway from this slide, is that if pyoderma gangrenosum is being considered in your differential, you really should refer to dermatology relatively rapidly for a biopsy and official diagnosis. And again, a, a sort of somewhat better um, series of diagnostic criteria have been proposed and, and uh, by one of your own as well. Um, and, and this is a Delphi consensus of experts. And basically, the leading point here is that you need a biopsy to make this this diagnosis. And again, if you're worried about PG, send to dermatology for, for um, rapid biopsy and diagnosis.
So what do I do once we've made the diagnosis? How do I treat this condition? I just told you, you know, it can be pretty morbid and can expand rapidly. And so the treatment of pyodermic gangrenosum is really determined by the severity of disease and its rate of progression. So in relatively rapidly progressive disease, early aggressive management can significantly reduce morbidity. And I think one of the big mistakes that I see people make is they don't think about PG treatment in two separate arms. So to me, one, the first thing we have to do is stop the inflammation. The second thing we have to do is heal the wound but these are really two separate processes. I think often we give anti-inflammatories and people expect the wound to be immediately healed and that's typically not the case. So we'll talk through each of these. Now, as I said, in most cases, systemic therapy is indicated, and, and different first-line options include corticosteroids, cyclosporin, and different TNF inhibitors. Unfortunately, there are really only two randomized uh, controlled trials looking at management of PG, and, and quite frankly, all of these may work um, decently well in a different subset of patients. What I really try to do is tailor the medication to the patient and their underlying comorbid disease, as well as their underlying driver condition. So if this is a patient with inflammatory bowel disease that needs a TNF inhibitor, I'm much more inclined to start them on something like infliximab than give them high dose PRET. Now, again, I want to point out that an appropriate response to therapy is one of these proposed minor diagnostic criteria for pyoderma gangrenosum. And so if patients fail to respond within a week to your initial management, and when I say a week, what I expect to see is decreased pain, decreased exudate, decreased erythema, and decreased edema within that first week. I don't expect the wound to be healed. But if patients are not responding as you expect, I, I always make sure, A, do I have the right diagnosis? And B, am I treating the underlying driver condition? And in this case, inflammatory bowel disease needs to be well controlled in order to control the skin. Now, again, immunosuppressives are for this active violaceous border and this exudate and the pain associated with it. They're not going to close the wound immediately. So this is what I expect to respond to immunosuppressive therapy. Again, this is one of my patients. He was started on prednisone. This is his wound within a couple of weeks, and this is him a couple of months later. But again, this part takes time, and that's really what I want to highlight here. Again, specifically in treating patients with underlying inflammatory bowel disease as their driver condition, I, I always talk with their gastroenterologist and we try to identify which medications have the dual benefit of both intestinal and cutaneous disease control. So the medication classes I'm most frequently using are TNF-alpha inhibitors, IL-1223 inhibitor, and different immunomodulators beyond that. And I often get asked by gastroenterologists about integrin inhibitors, and I just want to point out, we really don't think that they work well to control skin disease. And in fact, if there's another option available, I really try to steer away from them. I don't think they're particularly helpful with any of the extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease. And then for more refractory disease, we get into things like IL-1 inhibitors, IVIG, and actually JAK inhibitors, which I know are emerging for many different utilities. But Tofacitinib is currently approved for moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, and it's recently been shown to downregulate both JAK and STAT pathway phosphorylation in pyoderma gangrenosum specifically. So a patient with perisomal PG and peripheral PG, a subset of patients, and both improved with therapy of, of um, JAK inhibition. And then once you've calmed down the inflammation, the second part of that process is really healing the wound. And I just want to point out that most ulcers are multifactorial, right? So the things you should consider when you're thinking about wound healing, when there's no more inflammation, are really things like vascular supply, adequate compression if needed, but not too much compression if it's pyoderma gangrenosum because of pathergy, appropriate irritant removal, especially important in peristomal disease where there's constant stoma output, adhesive, and appliances being put on the skin. Gentle debridement, and typically this is with something like Santal or collagenase. I, I am usually pretty careful with mechanical debridement in these patients. Different topical therapies can be added to really maximize wound healing, things like Timolol. Exercise has been shown to be helpful in numerous different types of specifically venous ulceration, but actually some exercise in my PG patients like gentle walking has been very, very beneficial. And then specifically in the IBD population, I'm screening for things like vitamin D deficiency and zinc deficiency because both nutrients are critically important to wound healing. And then finally, ensuring that you don't have any ongoing infection in that area that would bring more neutrophils to, to the skin surface. And I do this with things like dilute acetic acid soaks, gentamicin ointment, or metronidazole gel. I'll just highlight, because this is medicine grand rounds, that not all ulcers are pyoderma gangrenosum. And I think this was a really nice study that came out in 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Basically, they reviewed the charts of 95 patients who carried a diagnosis of pyoderma gangrenosum, and 64 of these patients had already been treated with systemic immunosuppressive therapy for over 10 months.
Now, 86 of, pa 86 of the patients underwent biopsy, and really only around 50% ended up having a true diagnosis of pyoderma gangrenosum. Other patients had vasculitis, malignancy, or infection. And again, these are really important to consider before you systemically immunosuppress these patients long term. So key points from this case, over 50% of patients with pyoderma gangrenosum have an underlying systemic disease. Inflammatory bowel disease is one that we frequently see and should be treated because the driver condition needs to be treated in order to control the skin. Again, ClinPath correlation through a biopsy and referral to dermatology is key to the diagnosis, and treatment can really be tailored to the patient based on their underlying medical comorbidities. And with that, I'll just generate a, a summary of everything we talked about today. So again, the skin is such an important marker of underlying systemic health. Uh, I could talk about this topic for days based on the number of cases that I have, but instead we covered a couple of things that urticaria may be an early marker of alpha-gal meat allergy, that dermatitis herpetiformis is a skin manifestation of celiac disease, and that pyoderma gangrenosum is a reactive inflammatory condition that is relatively commonly seen in inflammatory bowel disease as well. Um, early recognition of the skin disease is highly important to reducing morbidity and mortality, and really multidisciplinary care is, is king in management of patients with systemic disease. So with that, I, I thank you guys for having me, and I'm happy to field any questions you may have. Okay, and thanks, uh, thanks Bridget. Uh, so uh, our tradition uh, when we have uh, medical grand rounds and we have a visitor from outside of Louisville is uh, oh. to give them a, a gift when they're here in person. Um, but uh, we're, we will ship you this gift, and um, you know, knowing uh, some about your background, you should like it. You should uh, recognize, uh, hopefully you recognize that uh, Louisville is uh, the home of um, the Louisville Slugger, uh, which, is, uh, which is a baseball bat. And oh. so uh, they uh, provide uh, baseball bats with uh, people's uh, names inscribed on them, and uh, we were able to uh, send you a, a, eventually. I don't think, we, Jason, we don't have a got picture it, of that, it. do we? Got it right here. No, there, Jason. Oh! Yeah. I love what, it! Not only what's done, Jason, get, we'll give yeah, this to the uh, the visitor, yeah. and, the, uh, and we have yes. uh, ma many pictures yeah. of uh, mm -hmm. people holding up a baseball bat and, you know, anyway, this will get shipped to you at a later date. And so yeah. that's, your, that's your plaque from, uh, you know, from this, uh, from this talk. Um, yeah, we've had, uh, let's see, I would say that, that of all the patients that I've seen with pyoderma gangrenosum, um, or have been sent to me as possible pyoderma gangrenosum, we have a, a host of them which have had alternate diagnoses. Um, so that uh, article that you pointed out from the Mayo Clinic, um, which was you know almost 20 years, 18 yeah. years ago now in the New England Journal. Uh, whenever I, you know, I mean, it, it's uh, it's something that was written about when pyoderma gangrenosum was initially um, put forward at the Mayo Clinic because that's where the people actually described it and used that applied that term um, in their in every medical text. Prior to the time of that article in the New England Journal, they pointed out it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And that article basically said about a quarter, 20 to 25 percent of the patients had alternate diagnoses. And we have had that unfortunately happen in multiple of our patients. Um, and we most recent one that I can recall is one we presented at our at our dermatology grand rounds. Uh, who had the comp complicating factor of the, that she had existing inflammatory bowel disease, and she had a painful ulcer uh, that occurred on her glabellar area. And the only thing she was concerned, and her inflammatory bowel disease was under, uh, was presumably quiescent. She'd had, she had an ulcer of colitis and had her colon had been removed. Sure. Um, and so we placed her on uh, corticosteroids and it made absolutely no difference. And all she talked about was, uh, was the, the pain, the pain, the pain. And it then when I called her primary care doctor, turned out that she was in a treat had been intermittently in treatment for pain management. Was a uh, was using uh, had used uh, various illicit drugs, and um, and it and her and we looked at her ulcer closely, and it had a lot of um, uh, angulation on the border, and so this ulcer that was occurring on her nasal bridge uh, was probably self induced, and so. Um, in that instance, uh, in that instance, we had another. We had an issue where she did indeed have a valid diagnosis of prior inflammatory bowel disease. Made us at least want to consider that strongly and 
And then uh, we were left with uh, the fact that she probably did actually had factitial disease. And, and I'll say I've actually had a couple of cases like that, not always factitial, but other causes of ulcer that have underlying IBD because I take all the referrals from the GI department here. Um, they're often inclined to switch their biologic and they send them to me saying, I think we're gonna switch them to this. And, and that's where a medical dermatologist can be so helpful and say, no, I really don't think that that's the problem here. Keep them on the biologic. The intestinal disease is so well controlled. I actually think this is something different. Um, yeah, we've, all, I've also, we've also recently, let's see, we had a patient who had cutaneous Crohn's, yep. um, which, uh, which um, was, is very difficult to manage, but was switched to vetalizumab and, uh, and then uh, had uh, much less ability to control the, uh, the disease at that point. Um, and then I actually have a case. I took it out this morning because I was too long, but it was a series of different cutaneous Crohn's pictures. I've sort of collected them, and you know what I found is interesting? I have a series of patients who have been followed. Um, either I made the diagnosis or someone else made the diagnosis on biopsy of cutaneous Crohn's, but they never go on to develop intestinal disease. And so we're actually, there's somebody else who does some IBD derm out in Boston, and we're, we're talking about these cases because she has a subset as well, and we're going to try to write them up, but but also we're uh, we have some research ongoing here to better study these because it, it's really fascinating when you have cutaneous Crohn's but never develop luminal disease over seven to ten years. The question becomes, is it is it really cutaneous Crohn's or you know like what's happening where you don't have intestinal disease but you have skin disease? Any uh, anybody else have other comments or questions? Jump in. I don't see anything. I don't see anything in the chat uh, box. Uh, or I haven't seen anything in the chat box that was a question, so I don't think I missed it. And I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand either, so. Well, I, I'm thrilled about my gift. I actually toured the Louisville uh, Slugger factory when I was down there for a tournament, and I couldn't afford a real bat at the time because I was in college, so I got one of the mini bats, and I, I'm so happy to have a real bat. I'll probably send you guys pictures of me, like, hitting with it. Like, I'll probably go play with it. <laughs> Well, yeah, but then you'll then you'll destroy that uh, the markers on it, you know. <laughs> I won't. I won't. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Callan, Dr. Shields, thank you so much this morning. This was really really great. Thank you guys so much for having me. Such a pleasure to join, and I, I have so many derm lecture, GI derm lectures, I could, uh, or nutrition derm, all of them. I could give give many. So excited to be here. Cool. And I'm not sure should I say on Iowa or on Wisconsin. So. <laughs> Uh, I like to cheer for a winning team, so on Wisconsin. Yeah, what's, right. And what's happening? Is it, is it the Wisconsin football team that's got infected with COVID? Yeah. And so they're postponing or canceling their various games? Yeah, unfortunately, they won They won their first one big, and then they all got COVID, including the coach. So hmm. it, it, hopefully we are up and playing soon. You yeah, Dr. canceled UVA because of COVID at UofL. Oh yeah, that's right. You're, I just noticed saw that last night, Doctor. This is uh, Doctor Furman from our internal medicine and uh, geriatrics. And uh, thank you for yeah, joining. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And U of L actually, yeah, they had to cancel their game at Virginia. Uh, I think they announced that last night because uh, U of L they they had a lot of players that were out, had a group of players that were out this past Saturday, and I guess it spread more, so they've had to actually cancel their game this weekend. So our our team is what you're saying. Yes, that correct. Yeah, you yeah. the Louisville team. So. And uh, Dr. Shields, I'll uh, email you uh, in a little bit if you if you have a preferred place you want the bat shipped to, and I'll, I'll get all that taken care of. So no problem. All right, everybody, thank you again. And Thanks uh, so next much, you guys. I appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. You too.